Welcome everybody uh, to our webinar of the Good Governance Academy together with the Pan-African Federation of Accountants. It's lovely to see um, everybody online. I see people are coming online now. Um, we have the chat function open. So if you would like to uh, tell us where you're from, I know we've got registrations from 38 different countries from around the world, countries from Australia through to the US, um, and then of course, across Africa, um, the Pan-African Federation of Accountants, of course, bringing that um, through for, for the attendees on today's webinar. My name is Carolyn Chalmers, and I'm the Chief Executive of the Good Governance Academy, but now I'd like to welcome Alter Prinsloo to, tell it, to introduce us and welcome us to this webinar. Thank you. Thank you so much, Carolyn. Good day, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to today's webinar co-hosted by the Pan-African Federation of Accountants and the Good Governance Academy, during which we will explore an African perspective to the expectation gap between the public, the accountant, and the auditor. In the 18th public report of the International Public Interest Oversight Board, the chair, Linda De Beer, explains that their Mind the Gap initiative was born to generate dialogue between various actors in the financial ecosystem. They include accountants, preparers, audit practitioners, and other assurance providers, policymakers, investors, users of financial statements, financial executive, audit committees, academics, and the public at large. The intention is to provide them an opportunity to share their points of view on narrowing the expectation gap and serving the public interest. We are therefore delighted that Linda is joining us today to share more about this important initiative. Welcome and thank you, Linda. The ninth colloquium of the Good Governance Academy held on 11 May, 2023, kick-started the dialogue with global thought leaders. We are grateful for the Good Governance Academy, Professor Mervyn King, patron of the Academy, and Carolyn Chalmers, CEO of the Academy, for the opportunity to add an African perspective to this dialogue. High quality reporting is essential to improve transparency, facilitate the mobilization of domestic and international investment, create a sound investment environment, and foster investor confidence towards promoting financial stability. There are an estimated 123,000 accountancy and finance professionals who are members of professional accountancy organizations in Africa. They, or you here today, play an essential role in high quality reporting and ultimately the continent's economic development. And professional accountancy organizations that are members of PAFA, currently 56 organizations in 45 countries in Africa, and those who are members of the International Federation of Accountants are obliged to use their best endeavors to promote the adoption and support the implementation of international standards on the continent. Ensuring Africa's voice is heard on international standard setting platforms is a key success factor for these professional accountancy organizations and their members in fulfilling their responsibilities. This underscores the importance of events such as today's webinar. I want to thank Imre Nagy, CEO of South Africa's Independent Regulatory Board for Auditors, Sandra Nyagi, Head of Corporate Planning and Strategy at Isuzu East Africa, my colleague Lebuchang Sen, Director Technical Excellence at PAFA, and all the participants for helping us to amplify Africans for Africa's voice in this important initiative. Colleagues, stay curious. Thank you so much. Back to you, Carolyn. Thank you very much. Unfortunately, Professor Mervyn King couldn't be with us today, but I'd like to share a, a recorded message from him. Thank you. Professor King, thank you so much for being with us today. I know that you are away. Um, just wanted to ask you in terms of the Mind the Gap colloquia, we know the colloquium, we know that the Good Governance Academy's colloquiums are really focused on 
the critical business issues in the world at the time and providing thought leadership on that. Why did you think that the gap and expectations between the auditor and accountant and the public in terms of mind the gap was an important and critical business issue? Well, um, you and I are directors of a company and let's assume you and I are trustworthy persons and um, we have a generally good reputation and therefore people should accept what we report on. But over the decades, it's been customary to have a third party assurance that notwithstanding your and my credibility, the third independent party would assure the reader, the user, that what you and I have put there as something that's happened during a reporting period is fairly stated. And in order to achieve this, <clears throat> there are standards by which you and I report. So let's just deal with why I wrote the book, uh, which was the Auditor Quo Vadis. I became concerned um, at least 15 years ago by the fact that uh, only about 30% of the market cap of companies could be found in the financial statements. And the rest was in the so-called non-financial area, then intangible assets, now sustainability issues, now ESG issues. And um, the public and the markets realized that companies were using natural assets faster than nature was regenerating them. And population was growing, so the demand for product was increasing. And um, <clears throat> that equation is got a frightening outcome because it makes the earth not sustainable. And yet the auditor uh, was auditing financial statements which were not dealing with 70% of value of a company. It also struck me that the accountant who has to become a registered auditor um, was actually having a business which was declining, that um, he or she or it, organization, a registered auditor with Uber, our regulatory body for auditing, and yet it was only giving assurance to the user on 30% of value of the company, being the number of shares in issue times the market price. And um, I said that sustainability reporting and integrated reporting was becoming more and more important. And the external auditor just has to start developing standards, international standards of auditing, ISAs, to try and audit these issues. Otherwise, the external auditor was actually going out of business. Um, this was of great concern to the auditing profession. At the same time, um, the auditor enters into a contract with the company to become the external auditor. And his or her job um, is to ensure that management has drawn the accounts and the board has approved those accounts according to the standards to which the management applied in drawing the accounts. So let's say there were the standards of the IASB International Accounting Standards Board and reflected from a judgmental basis, the auditor would say this is a fair presentation of the financial position of the company and in compliance with the IASB standards. So the auditor's job was, is, uh, to ensure that management had drawn their accounts according to standards, and that from that you could draw a conclusion that 
there was a fair presentation of the financial position of, of this organization. But no auditing of the so-called non-financial space, which was growing in importance. And we know, uh, Karen, that um, the ESG funds are out maneuvering the capital funds, which are just based on profit. And um, ESG has become of great importance, so much so that the IFRS has now got its own sustainability reporting arm, the ISSB. Um, the public, however, expected the auditor to find out if there was any misconduct in the company and to report on that. And that was never his or her function. So I've often said in canine terms, the auditor is not a bloodhound to sniff out misconduct. It mustn't be a laptop, it must be arm's length and independent from management and the board. But it is, it is, uh, it is um, a watchdog to make sure that management is drawn according to standards and that you can, f you can draw the conclusion reasonably that there's a fair presentation of the financial position of the company. So this expectation gap has developed over the last hundred years between the public and the external auditor. And when something goes wrong, um, the particularly if there's a liquidation, the um, the liquidator of a company would sue the auditors on a basis that it had failed to comply with a certain ISA international standard of auditing, or had not correctly applied the international standard of auditing. Now, assuming that is proven, in terms of the laws of contract, the auditor becomes liable for 100% of the loss of the company. Now, in delict in a wrong, uh, you and I are traveling in the uncontrolled intersection. We collide, you're doing 50 k's an hour, I'm doing 100 k's an hour. Um, your car is damaged, my car is damaged. The court has the power in terms of the apportionment of damages act to apportion loss and to apportion, apportion harm. So it can say, well, you, Mervyn King, were doing 100 k's an hour, and Carolyn was only doing 50 k's an hour. So, Carolyn, you pay 50% of Mervyn King's loss, and Mervyn King, you pay 100% of her loss. In the thoroughbred breeders case, which was about uh, 40 years ago, it went all the way up to the then Pellet Division, now called the Supreme Court of Appeal. It was one of the big six, one of the big four were the auditors, and um, they had failed to comply specifically and in detail with a certain ISA. Meanwhile, the company's loss was actually the cause and the causal connection of the loss was that the chief operating officer had gone rogue and uh, he had siphoned a lot of money out of the company. The big six auditing firm joined him as a co-defendant and said, well, it's not only our failure to do this ISA specifically, uh, as it should be done, it's he is the real cause of the harm, and you should apportion blame, eighty percent, maybe twenty percent us, but we are <clears throat> we are ex post facto. He actually created the harm. So, but the Supreme Court of Appeal, a majority judgment, I must say, <clears throat> said. This apportionment of damages only applies in delict, not in contract. I believe they were wrong. I side with the minority judgment. 
Uh, but the auditing profession, of course, was extremely concerned about this because when something goes wrong, the company or the liquidator, the company's in liquidation, will go for a defendant that's got the deepest pockets. And the auditor has the deepest pockets because he or she or it is obliged to ensure uh, if they are sued for some failure of the audit, so they are covered. And um, I'm sure you've heard of cases of the big six and maybe even a smaller firm being sued for hundreds, hundreds of millions of dollars sometimes. So you could actually get uh, an audit firm going beyond the limit of its insurability and its insurance cover and actually go out of business. Um, no, I think that's completely wrong. So the Auditors Profession Act tried to cover this by amending the Audit Profession Act, but in my submission, they didn't go far enough. And uh, we really still need to test it in court. They changed the Audit Profession Act to try and say that an auditor could join another defendant, but they didn't express the terms as such. And um, it's uh, now a legal debate as to whether an auditor can join um, another wrongdoer. So the expectation gap of the public that the auditor didn't sniff out, for example, in the thoroughbred breeders case, that the chief operating officer was committing a wrong. Um, they were liable and they sued them for 100% of the loss. And the court have held that. So this expectation gap has huge ramification. It, it's a belief out there in the public that the auditor must sniff out what is wrong. And um, the auditor, I call the big four the last four, because they've got a balance sheet which uh, they can afford to buy the generative AIs that are being developed around the world, which expedite audits, expedite certain internal audit functions. And that's why today you're getting hybrid internal audit, where you have an internal auditor, but attached to one of the big six, because they can expedite the internal audit function. They've got the AIs to do it. But, um, the other audit firms haven't got the balance sheet to buy all this new uh, technology. And that's why I call them the last four. And uh, we need <laughs> we need to make sure they're around because we do need that, um, that external audit to add credibility to what we report. So the expectation gap is an essential business issue. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. And at this point, I'd like to ask Linda um, to um, come and uh, present to us on the Mind the Gap. Now, Linda is the chair of the Public Interest Oversight Board that has launched this project. So I'll um, leave this to Linda. Thank you. Thank you so much for this, Caroline. And thank you again for the invitation. Caroline will be driving my slides for me. Um, I've got lots to say, but I don't have a lot of time. So I want, and we rather want to have a, a conversation afterwards in the form of a, a bit of a discussion. So let me just say one thing when you talk about an African perspective. It's, I, I am from Africa, it's in my blood, and I live in, uh, I'm right here next to the BRIC summit at the moment. And it is such a privilege to, to talk to people from PAFA. So thank you so much for that. I will not let the opportunity go by before I talk about Mind the Gap and what we're thinking about and the expectation gap um, to just also say something about the PIOB because the Public Interest Oversight Board is not that well known. And I just want to spend a few minutes on that. Um, but before we get there, Caroline, I'm going to ask you to maybe just go to the video and let's just spend the video is very short. It's just a few minutes just to talk a little bit about our thinking on Mind the Gap. And, and I think it tells you quite a bit about what the PIOB is about. So I'm going to pause for a second and hand back to you, Caroline. The 
the PRB's ultimate objective is to make sure that the public interest is served in the work done by the two standard setting rules. So we can't really judge what that is unless we understand what our stakeholders tell us. So for me, this day is really, really important because we got an opportunity to bring stakeholders together and to hear their thoughts and to engage with them and to build relationship. What is needed to fill the gap or bridge the gap and that helps us very much to do our job as the PIOB to oversee the work of the two standard setting boards because ultimately we all need to work together to either succeed or to fail the system. The Mind the Gap campaign is really important to us and it might sound like a silly initiative but it is important because the concept of the expectation gap between what is expected of auditors and I want to add to that accountants and what is delivered by them has been a concept that's been a problem for a very long time and we would like to play our role as the PIO to firstly understand what the gap is. So when you say mind the gap, what is the back? How gap? How big is the gap? What is causing the gap? So we need to understand where there's a differing view between the stakeholders out there and what the standards are addressing. But it doesn't help if we just understand the problem. The mind the gap campaign is also about solutions. Each one of us potentially have a different view of the public interest. So if we really want to fully understand what the, let's call it the big ticket items, what are the non-negotiables for the sake of protecting the capital markets, for the sake of making sure that, we, that the audit profession keeps and regains its credibility, um, we need to be innovative and, and that means we need to pull together all the thoughts. We said a couple of times today, we want to move fast, which is hard to do when you're lots of people, but we also want to go far. You can't do both of that unless you collaborate with people. Thank you so much. And Caroline, let's let's move on um, a couple of slides to where we have the index. And and I know I could I simply couldn't see the video. I could just yeah. So if you did it, you, if you could also just yeah. I don't think that's the end of the world. Um, it's just to tell you a little bit about what we're about at the PIOB. And I want to say a few things more because I it is important that you understand where we come from and why we do what we do before I talk about Mind the Gap and specifically about the expectation gap and what we're doing about it. If you go to the next slide, I just want to show you this from an African perspective. This is also important for me. This is the PIOB. So the PIOB gets appointed by a group called the Monitoring Group, and the Monitoring Group comprised the biggest international regulators and organizations, there's seven of them, I won't, or eight, actually, I won't list them all, but it's basically the international securities, the stock exchange regulators, securities regulators, Basel, who's the banking regulator, the World Bank, etc. cetera. Um, and, and they basically got together way back about 17, 18 years ago and said that they wanted to put an organization in place that makes sure that the international standards that are set for auditors and accountants, in other words, the auditing standards set by the IAASB, as well as the ethics standards set by IS, by the International Ethics Standards Board for Accountants, that those standards have a public interest perspective, that they're responsive to the needs of the public interest. And that's why when they established the PIOB um, and we have 10 members on our board. That's the picture that you can see. Um, what we do is we have people from different parts of the world that get appointed by the monitoring group. And we think about what we believe would be standards that respond to the public interest. And can you see where the expectation gap comes in? So important in auditing standards, but also in accounting standards. And 
when we do that, we also obviously talk to a lot of really important stakeholders, different stakeholders, as Alta said at the beginning, but we go to the meetings of those standard setters and we make sure that they, they, we observe them and we make sure that they respond to the public interest. I want to just point out, if you look at people's background here, and you can see all of this on our website, so I won't talk about it, but in a, in a board of 10, we've got two people from Africa. My colleague Tsego is from Botswana, and she's um, in a senior p a position at, at, at Debswana. I actually spoke to her yesterday. It is just really, really good to know that the African perspective is certainly represented. If we go to the next slide, we... Um, Ultimately, it's not about us and about what we say and what we believe. Ultimately, it's about making sure that those standards that we've mostly adopted in all our African countries, the international standards on, for auditing ISAs, um, as well as the ethics code, that it's relevant to the and responsive to the public interest, that those standards that our auditors across our continent apply both on the ethics and the independence um, side as well as on the audit side actually make a difference. If we move on, I'll just show you a few things on how we do it because what we, what we want to achieve is making sure that we've got the right two standard setting boards, the right people around the table appropriately represented. We do that by controlling the nomination process, we're responsible to appoint people to those two boards. But we also make sure that we check and approve the, the process around um, how uh, the standards get approved. Then we want to, so it's the, the people around the board and what's on the agenda. We also want to make sure that there's sufficient independent oversight. We can only add value as the PIOB if we have the right things on our agenda and if we have the right people around the table. So how do we do that? We do that by making sure that um, we engage our group of 10 with our small little staff in, in Madrid of six people, that we engage with our stakeholders, that we understand what the issues are. Um, we also make sure that we have the right people around our table that understand the issues, that's got international, broad, different perspectives, so that we can get to the best answer. We know very well the value of diversity of skills and experience. And then we have ongoing engagements with the two chairs of the two standard setting boards, IAASB and IESPA, to make sure that we have a meeting of minds. Our job is not a policing function to catch them out and at the end point out that they got it wrong. Our job is to make sure that as they move through the process and the project of a standard, that they actually pick up the right and the important issues. And the last thing that we need to actually achieve this goal is we obviously need money. It's very important that both the PIOB and the two standard setting boards have enough funding that we can get the best people, that we can do the necessary outreach, that can we can ultimately get to the place where the standards are pitched at the right level and responsive to the public interest. If you go to the next slide, you will see we, we basically have two main activities. We do oversight, and that is looking at what the board, two boards are doing, standard setting boards, what's on the strategy, what's on the work plan. But we go into the level of specific projects and the drafting of specific standards. We have agreed as broader stakeholders on a public interest framework and what the criteria would be. And I'll speak a little bit about that when I talk about our Mind the Gap campaign for standards to be responsive to the public interest. So that's our one role. Our second role that we took over a few years ago from IFAC was we take responsibility to appoint members to the IAASB and IESPA. And right at the end, I'm gonna say a few things on what I think we as Africans should be doing in advancing that, that job.
and that role of the of the PIOB. We also do the assessments of the standard setting board chairs and of the of the two standard setting boards. Okay, let's go to the Mind the Gap campaign and we talk about some of the gaps. And this is where you will see that there is definitely in the thinking of this, we thought about small economies, we thought about different economies, we thought about people that potentially do business differently. So one, the first gap that I want to talk about is the scale gap, because there's often a risk, and we've said that sometimes with, with accounting or financial reporting standards, and we have to think about it carefully when it comes to sustainability reporting as well. There's a risk that it's written only for the big multinationals. And one of the things that we try to really embed and, and push when it comes to the projects of the IAASB and IESPA is scalability. It must be written in a way that it's not just for a big multinational, but that small auditors from small firms or auditors that audit smaller entities and companies that it's sensible for them as well. That the difference is, we can't just have two complete different sets of standards for, for the two, even though there is the, the LCE, less complex um, entity standard in the pipeline, but principally scalability is one of the gaps that we keep on pushing. If we go to the next gap, and I'm just using a few as an example. If you go to the next gap, the legislation gap, we come from different countries with different um, different pieces of legislation, different underlying principles in the legislation. In Mervyn's um, opening remarks, he spoke a little bit about the South African legislation around auditors. When Mervyn and I wrote that book, The Auditor Covardus, Covardus, where to? We didn't just look at South African legislation, we looked at some of the things that are happening elsewhere in the world. Some countries have limited liability for auditors or some ring fencing around liability, uh, around um, auditor liability. Some countries have protection for whistleblowers. So it's the no claw, um, uh, uh, non-compliance um, with laws and regulation requirement in the code is easier in some countries because there's no legal liability for people that blow the whistle. Other countries don't. It's very important for the standard setting boards to be sensitive and to try and find a path, a golden thread through that without settling for the lowest common denominator. That's something that's very important. You know in PAFO that the um, that the French speaking and the English speaking um, side of Africa have very different foundations for legislation. And that's something that the standard setting boards have to be sensitive to. If we go to the next one, we also talk a little bit about things like this, what we're talking about today, the expectation gap. And if you talk about an African perspective, I'm not convinced that our experience of the expectation gap is so much different. When something goes wrong, we also, in our countries, like we've seen with Wirecard in Germany, like we've seen with so many examples, we also firstly say, we'll ask, where were the auditors? We also think about what can we do better? What can we do differently? What did the regulators miss, et cetera, when it comes to the expectation? We all have a similar expectation, sometimes misinformed, but a similar expectation that auditors are the safe hands, the watchdog, Mervyn called it earlier on, the watchdog that must, must flag to us as investors, as employees, as stakeholders, when things go wrong. Sometimes that's unfair. Is it the job to flag to us that this is not a viable business model? Um, but sometimes that it means that the standard should be pushed a little bit further. For example, we are pushing the IWSB to push the fraud standard further, not just to keep on telling us what auditors don't do around fraud, but should they not be building in a little bit more for auditors to do and a little bit more for auditors to tell 
if there are fraud risk indicators. So that is another and a very, very important gap. The expectation gap is almost the underlying um, objective why we continuously have to work on enhancing the credibility of the audit profession. So go back, if I go back to our public interest issues, um, we continuously try to reinforce the um, standard setting boards to just really push a little bit further and harder to, um, Catalan, you can go to the next slide, to enhance the public interest, to be responsive to the public interest. We also have to remind them to prioritize because they are, dozens of important things to do. But we know if you become mile wide in your agenda, you can only deal with it inch thick. So focus is important. Let's focus on the big ticket items that will actually make a difference. We also really, really try to continuously push them and challenge them and ask them, are you going far enough? Are you going far enough in dealing with going concern? Are you going far enough in dealing with independence aspects, in dealing with non-audit services and, and, and fees from non-audit services, et cetera? It's also very important to weigh the stakeholders because realistically, comments are not similar and stakeholders don't have the same view. And... Um, it's not about who sends the most comment letters. It's about how do you weigh these comments to actually push forward in responding to the public interest. Then um, uh, the one other point that we make there is the thematic public interest objectives, the things around scalability, uh, clarity of the standards, understandability, um, and continuously pushing for further disclosure by auditors where it's possible. And then I've spoken about the public interest I mentioned. I won't mention that again. So Cal Caroline, I think you can maybe skip um, um, and go to the, the final slide there. What I would like to sort of say in conclusion is it's really important for us at the PIOB to keep on chipping away at the public interest and keep on firstly understanding it and understanding what stakeholders ask of us, uh, ask of the standards to keep on pushing to get the right people on the board and make sure that they focus on these right agendas as I mentioned, but also to make sure that in doing that we enhance the credibility of the audit profession. Mervyn said it earlier, and it's very true. Everybody will be poorer. Everybody will be shortchanged if audit doesn't work and if audit is not there. It's in nobody's interest to have a world of reporting where there's not an independent assurance function. That is really important. But therefore, we have to make sure that auditors are focusing on the right things at the right level. There are many stakeholders that have a role to play, not just standard setters, but certainly also regulators, investors, and so on. It's in all of our best interest. It's also in all of our best interest that not just auditors, but the larger accounting profession actually um, act in a fashion that is defendable, that is ethical, that is beyond question. And often the things that go wrong are not in the first instance at an audit level, but at an ethics level. Ethics by financial directors, ethics by boards of directors, ethics by lots of people that belong to our profession. And therefore the ethics code is so important. And again, it's not just about what the code says. It's about the implementation thereof. It's about the understanding thereof. And, and therefore, it's very, very important for us. I've always felt very strongly about this. If you come from a developing country where we have to fight for foreign investment, you can only get foreign investment if there's confidence in your reporting, if there's confidence in your system, if there's confidence in your accounting and audit profession. And 
it's much harder for us in Africa because we often much small economies that have to fight against the big, big other economies in the world. And I think there's no end to the importance of this. The last point that I would like to make, um, Carolyn, is just around what about the people in this virtual room? What's your job? What's your role beyond focusing on these things, as I said? When it comes to the PIOB, we, I would like to say, need two things of you. We need you to get around the table. How do you get around the table? You get around the table by doing two things. You need to comment on exposure drafts, on strategies, on work plans of these two boards. Because only if you comment is there an understanding of what our needs are, what the African perspective is. You don't have to comment and respond to everything and all the questions. If you just have one thing to say, Say it, put it on a piece of paper, send in an email, send in a comment letter to the standard setting boards because that is how your view is heard. But secondly, we also need you around the table by nominating people th that are up to the challenge to participate and become members of the two standard setting boards, to become members of the standing advisory group and to join in in those international debates and discussions. It's really important to have that view. So those are the things that we need from the, uh, to get the African perspective baked into all of this. I'm gonna pause there and I'm gonna hand back to you. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you very much, Linda. And we're going to go on now to a, a panel discussion um, with those insights in mind and bringing those insights through, I'm going to hand over to Lebo Gang uh, from PAFA, who's going to facilitate this panel discussion. Lebo Gang, over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Carolyn, and thank you to Linda and everybody that has spoken before us. Um, joining me today, um, Alta did already indicate we have um, Mr. Emre Nagy from the RBA here in South Africa, the Independent Regulatory Board, and um, Ms. CPA Sandra Njagi, who is um, with Isuzu in, uh, in Kenya. Have I been talking to myself all this time and nobody said anything? No, it's been good. <laughs> Sorry, I just got a, a you're muted. Um, perfect. So I will not speak through my panelists' um, CVs, but please feel free. I've just put there um, the link to where you can find a little bit more information about them. Um, they're all very, very well learned and experts in their field. So I think, you know, we've already heard a little bit um, when... Prof, um, Prof King had his um, interventions. He's made reference to strong words like the hard dog and um, you know the, the perception that auditors are intended to sniff out wrongdoing. Um, Linda used more gentle words. He said auditors are the safe hands. But I would like to turn to, maybe let's start with you, Imreza, as the thorn among the roses to give us your perception or rather how do you define um, the audit expectation gap and um, why is it critical to the concept um, that we are discussing today? Why is it an important topic to discuss? Also, if you believe there are misconceptions, what do you think um, is contributing to that misconception? Sandra, I will ask you to respond to the same question once Imre has concluded his remarks. Well, good afternoon, uh, Lebo Khang, and good afternoon to everybody joining today. Uh, thank you very much for this opportunity to be part of this event. Um, so Levukhan, for me, generally, maybe I'm coming from a slightly different perspective, which, which is always good. Uh, so for me, generally, the expectation gap um, is linked to the social compact. And um, often the social compact is referred to also as the social compact, uh, which refers to the unwritten agreement between individuals and institutions in a, in a society. And I'm talking now in general terms. This social compact encapsulates the mutual expectations, the rights, the responsibilities, etc., that both individuals and institutions hold towards, towards each other. And, and these are normally measured by the level of trust. Um, 
to bring it a little bit closer now to auditing, and I'll, I'll focus on auditing because I'm representing an audit regulator, and I'm also a board member of EFR. Uh, for those that don't know, it's the um, International Forum of Independent Audit Regulators uh, from, from 54 countries, of which South Africa is a member, and, and a number of other African countries. We need more members, so, so please, if, if, uh, if anybody's interested, they can contact me. Uh, we also have a new associate membership at EFR. If you don't meet all the requirements, um, you, you could still uh, become part of, of the activities in some way. But this, but auditing Le Bochang plays a crucial role in maintaining transparency, accountability, and trust within the social compact. But when, when there are accounting failures and or audit failures because of fraud and misstatements, where the public lose their investments. Um, this is where the expectation gap originates from or, or gets wider and wider because people question why, why are there failures and losses if, if the accounts were, were prepared and audited by, by professionals and regulated, uh, that's regulated in a profession. So in the context of financial reporting, the audit expectation gap refers to the difference between what the public expects from auditors and what auditors actually provide. Um, and, and there is currently definitely a gap. And, and this gap is leading to a call uh, from stakeholders for auditors to do more, uh, to report on fraud and misstatements. Because people just don't want to, to continue to lose and to see their investments uh, deteriorate. And often these investments are linked to pension funds. Um, just to give you an idea, with Steinhoff, that uh, what happened in, in 2017 in Steinhoff, in a single day, it knocked off 300 billion rand in market cap. Uh, and, and 20 billion rand of that was invested by our public investment corporation, which uh, represents uh, state employees' um, pension funds. So, so people lose money, police women, police men, uh, you know, public servants at all levels lose out. And investors in general lose out when there are these events. And, and really that, that is, I would say, the, the origin of, 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 of an expectation gap. And my last comment on this is that obviously standard setters, and it's great to listen to Linda Professor Linda De Beer, who just explained to us the role of the PIOB over the standard setting boards. And even at a global level, level, it is so important to be part of that process, to be part of that ecosystem. Uh, so yes, I really agree with Linda to get involved, uh, even if it's at a very small scale to start, get the foot in the door and, and, and start to, to, to voice your, your, your views. But standard setters and regulators mostly agree that auditors can and should do more. But we also maintain the fact that fraud detention, uh, sorry, fraud detection uh, is not the primary function of the auditor. It, it can never be um, because auditors play a different role, a secondary role. They come in after the fact. They are not there when, uh, when directors of a company come up with schemes and, and, and they execute those schemes through decisions. So it remains the primary responsibility of management and those charged with governance within an organization to implement effective controls and processes to detect and manage fraud. They need to do their part and the auditors, that, that will enable the auditors also to do their part. And together, the, uh, you know, the system provides financial information that is credible and that can be relied upon by investors. Sandra, from a preparer's perspective, perhaps, what are your thoughts? <laughs> yeah, thank you, Le Bohang. Um, I think Imri uh, uh, has done a fair job of, of uh, defining what uh, the audit expectation uh, would be. Um, I would probably just want to add that uh, expectations are changing really uh this is not only an audit issue um it is an issue that touches on different stakeholders if you think about your consumers the traditional consumer uh required just quality service 
quality products and uh, a fair price. Today, your consumer requires a personalized connected experience. They are looking for data privacy, data protection. If you think about your stakeholders, traditionally your, st your shareholders would be looking for profits. Today, your shareholders are looking for purpose. Uh, they want to know what management is doing in regards to um, the environment, social impact. And so there's a lot of uh, shareholder activism. When you think about your employees who are previously your workers, today they want to be partners. They want to be sole partners of the organization and they believe that uh, there's a lot they are contributing. I mean, even you think about your children. Today, they want to challenge logic. So when you think about the audit expectation, um, it's the growing um, the growing uh, interest in terms of how issues are changing and what the public and other stakeholders expect, including the CFO, including the preparers. And maybe just to add uh, that SCCA, just like uh, Embry defined, is that the SCCA defines the expectation gap in audit as a difference between what the general public thinks auditors do and what the general public um, would like auditors to do. But I would also just like to add, add, add uh, an additional perspective of three areas uh, that we can define uh, this uh, audit expectation gap, uh, starting off with the knowledge gap, which basically talks about what the public thinks auditors do, vis-a-vis -vis what auditors actually do. You know, there's a lot of misconception there. When you think about the performance gap, which is the gap between what audit auditors actually do and what auditors are supposed to do. Because if you look at some of the scandals that happened, have happened across different economies, if you think about the Gupta case in South Africa, I think we have a, a lot of representation uh, from South Africa. What are the ethics? What is the independence that um, auditors are supposed to exercise in their performance of their roles? So the that gap you think about is the evolution gap. And that talks a bit about what I have talked about, what auditors are expected to do vis-a-vis -vis what the public wants auditors to do. The, there's a lot of growing expectation from the public on what the role of auditors should be, uh, that auditors do not just go in, uh, do an assessment and offer an assurance on the financial uh, statements. There's a lot of expectations from the public. And when you think about all this, then this, set, this sets uh, a big conversation in regards to should auditors remain the traditional auditors that we knew them to be, or is there an additional contribution that auditors can uh, provide to the preparers, to your shareholders, and to the different stakeholders? So I think I just want to add that and bring that um, additional perspective to the conversation, Abraham. Thanks, Sandra. Um, Linda, I think you are hearing the message. It sounds like there's definitely more that uh, auditors should be doing um, from both Imre and Sandra. But perhaps if we just go back to the social compact, this unwritten, unwritten agreement, we've touched that we've heard about the public in lots of ways. When we start thinking about different stakeholders, such as regulators, um, investors, do you see that um, the, there's a difference in how they, these particular stakeholders view their expectations um, on the role and responsibilities of, um, of the auditors? Does, is there an alignment if for those kind of like slightly different stakeholders versus the general public, Linda? Um, yeah, that's a very important, and very interesting um, question. I do believe there's, if you, there's always an exception, but if you, if you, if you go down the middle of the road and speak to the, the average investor versus um, regulate it versus person in the public. I do think generally what is expected of auditors, assuming it's people that understand the role of an auditor, generally there is a, a large degree of alignment. Having said that, I, you see regulators pick up gaps where they know the auditor in terms of a normal statutory audit won't and can't do something, they add additional requirements and regulations. So you see bank regulators adding things for auditors to look at. There's a lot of debate um, now in some countries around what tax regulators, tax authorities 
are starting for auditors to sign off on because they know that that's not the normal um, responsibility of auditors. So you see regulators picking this up. You see audit regulators and securities regulators picking up additional independence requirements and ethics requirements for auditors because they understand that that's not part of auditors' normal expectation. I deal quite a bit with the investor community. We've got somebody from the CFA Institute on our PIOB board as well. And, and we often hear that the investors potentially expect more of auditors than what they can do under the existing requirements and existing compact as, as um, Imbray referred to. And that is exactly instances where you probably want to make sure that the auditors go further, that the standards go a little bit further beyond, not to the place, as you said, Imre, where auditors become forensic auditors, because that's certainly not something that we want, that we expect all that companies can afford. That is you, your point, the right directors and honest management and, and to deal with those things and auditors to flag if they're problems. So I would like to believe that there is an alignment. I deal a lot with the global leadership of the, of the bigger firms. And if you speak to those global CEOs, global assurance leads and so on, it's in their best interest that auditors get it right. They mm -hmm. understand if they don't get it right, they are, they are actually on a burning platform. So, but having said that, then we see things that go badly wrong. Um, we've seen the tax scandal in Australia recently. We've seen many instances where things go badly, badly wrong. So despite the best will in the world, the firms sometimes become as strong as their weakest link. And as the partner that doesn't do his job properly or the one that is potentially dishonest or breaching independence and so on. So there are always exceptions. There are exceptions when it comes to uh, people that put money above everything, um, despite what potentially the message is from their, their global leadership. And there are exceptions of people in the public that when something goes wrong, wants a villain, wants to see blood. And the obvious one, as Mervyn said, will be the auditors with the deep pockets, with the with professional indemnity insurance. Mm -hmm. And I would never say, and I've been involved in, in cases against um, auditors, um, we, I would never say don't take action against the auditor, but there's also action to be taken against some, some other people in many instances. And, and, and I think that's, those are the sort of the two extremes that we unfortunately sometimes see. Thanks, Linda. Um, I'd like to just go back to you, Sandra. So you have the benefit of, you know, being on the preparer side, but also having um, the experience of the auditor. Um, you know, at the currently in your role, you are the one that is now getting the end product, which is the audit report as the customer of that auditor. Do you think that there's a way that audit reports can, is there a way, a, a role that um, audit reports can um, can be used to better communicate the, the limitations perhaps? Um, is there a way that um, the auditors can communicate the limitations of their role? But also I just want to um, touch on the CFO. Um, looking from a CFO's perspective, what influence can um, youth in the preparer side have in limiting or managing the expectation gap? Uh, thank you for that uh, question. Yes, uh, sitting in from the preparer side, I think uh, auditors are doing an awesome job of uh, giving a very big caveat, yeah? Uh, on, from their audits in terms of what their roles uh, restrict them or what their responsibility, how far it goes. So I think in terms of um, how what auditors can do to reduce the expectation gap, I know um, for every audit report, and I know we have auditors in this audience, uh, there's a bit the reports of the independent auditors that is structured in terms of the 
audit report where the opinion of the financial statement is given. And then I think uh, for most of the these reports, there's also an area that talks about the disclaimer on other information, you know, things to do with like the chairman's report, the MDs, that's the management, uh, managing director's report or the chief executive officer report, the CSR report or the marketing report. Uh, I, I, I know there's also usually a disclaimer and here I'm talking about uh, from the perspective of a preparer, even uh, a disclaimer on the, on the financial highlights, but I mean financial highlights are actually most of the times just a summary of what is in the financial statements. So that's still contributing to the expectation gap. So I think in terms of what um, the audit report can be used to bring in uh, to reduce the expectation gap, um, there's a bit uh, of more additional information that auditors can provide um, over and above the compliance and indicating that the audit is done as per the standards, the international auditing and accounting standards as per provided or the ethics, um, the standards from the International Ethics Standards Board for accountants. Um, the auditors uh, have a bigger role to play in terms of giving additional insights. I mean, they look at, and they know the, the audit uh, period is limited, probably a week or two weeks uh, in the year or a month. Uh, but if auditors could provide some additional insights in terms of what they are seeing in those uh, reports, uh, in terms of the trends, uh, utilization of analytics, I mean, everybody is big on data as we speak at the moment, highlighting issues to do with the things that they see that affect the various businesses. For example, for me, I come uh, from the automotive uh, sector and I believe as auditors, uh, given that the especially external auditors audit different uh, organizations, there are certain issues or trends that they see and th that would be quite a bit of a value add um, to the preparers or your CFO uh, that they can provide in the audit reports to be in a position to give more value. Issues to do with emerging issues like ESG, uh, the issues of governance, sustainability reporting, issues to do with data governance. I mean, with that interaction that auditors have during the audit period, there's a lot of insight that they come across. And I, I know a lot of the, the information that comes out of the detailed management reports that we receive or the management letters has to do with the issues that are seen or what they identify as audit issues to be followed up upon. But I think even from just the value of providing additional insights from what they see as they do the audit, uh, that would be a good value add, not only for the CFO, your preparer, but even for your shareholders, because the same auditors, uh, auditors will go and do that reporting to the board. So I think in a nutshell, uh, those are some of the things that auditors can do a bit more to reduce on the expectation gap. Thanks, Andrew. I want to just bring Imre back into the conversation, especially because you touched on a little bit of that, um, you know, the technology aspect and how that's um, affecting audit at this point. But Imre, you know, when uh, I was studying and in fact during my audit days as well, professional skepticism is a term that, um, you know, is drummed into our heads as, as um, auditors. How can auditors enhance their uh, professional skepticism in your mind and their judgment to better meet um, the, the, the expectations of um, stakeholders? So good question. Uh, professional skepticism and judgment is, is, is a very important topic. Uh, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll backtrack a little bit uh, by stating that since 2012, um, if you are performs an annual survey of inspection findings across its 54 members. And we participate annually in providing um, inspection findings for the GPPC firms. These are the uh, six, uh, six large global network firms. Um, and the number one finding from the survey from, from independent regulators over all these years is in the area of accounting estimates and, and fair value measurement, which is, which is an area that requires substantial elements of, of judgment. So in most recent, uh, in the most recent EFR survey report that was released earlier this year, uh, and it's available on the EFR website, uh, it, it, this particular inspection theme made up 17% of all findings raised on listed issuers um, globally. That's quite a high percentage if you, if you dice 
if you slice and dice the the pie chart of of the diff different types of findings, and um, and and it speaks to this particular point. Uh, so most regulators agree that one of the root causes of of this lack of of this is a lack of applied professional skepticism by auditors, um, which which falls in the realm. Uh, and I'm not an expert on this, but for me, it falls in, falls in the realm of ethics and, and conduct. Um, the ethics code for auditors is very clear in its fundamental requirements for auditors to be independent, objective, and to apply sufficient levels of, of professional skepticism. Um, so firstly, to answer your question, as a registered auditor myself, I used to practice Auditors, as auditors, we need to cons constantly remind ourselves to remain independent in mind, uh, unbiased, uh, mm. and not to become, well, you know, not to be influenced by, by our surroundings or, 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 the, or those that we audit, and not to become complacent when we assess areas that require judgment. Uh, auditors should especially be aware of threats like familiarity, uh, familiarity threats associated with long tenure uh, and maybe another one that's quite important is the intimidation threat uh, that could that you know all of these things could reduce the levels of of of, of skepticism because when when you distract it as an auditor is uh, by these things uh, that is when an auditor can miss important risks Secondly, auditors need to acknowledge that they must be diligent when assessing management assumptions, but moreover, they must train themselves to exercise professional courage. For me, professional skepticism is one thing, but you can't be skeptical if you don't have the courage to actually implement that skepticism. Courage is more, uh, for me, uh, a verb. Um, uh, it, 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 it's a better, it, it better de describes the trait or the behavior of the auditor in implementing professional skepticism. So in other words, auditors must be brave to question management where necessary and to corroborate management assumptions and inputs with reliable evidence. Um, when, when I hear the word professional skepticism and I try to understand it, it is more of a behavioral trait than a technical one, but yes, the technical part is as important when assessing, for example, an evaluation. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, that it's important that you have the technical knowledge, but knowing that management has a bias to overvalue because the performance of the organization is linked to their performance and rewards. These areas of judgment must be thoroughly assessed and challenged as much as is necessary for the auditor to, to opine on, uh, on, on fair presentation. It is, it is the independent mindset. Uh, in I'm, I'm, I'm summarizing. It's, it, it's the independent mindset of the auditor, coupled with the courage to challenge without fear, uh, and to combine that with the technical competence and skill. That package is what is necessary to apply and implement professional skepticism. Uh, continuous. Uh, Professional development CPD is also very important and it, 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 it can help and it should help. Um, but I see the CPD more on the technical side of things, you know, because what is also true is that an auditor can be very, very skeptical, but without the technical competence and experience, he or she might not identify uh, the underlying misstatements. And, and you know, that is, the, that is what happens it takes one of those oversights within an auditor's um, pr process that can miss something substantial in a particular evaluation that ultimately can have a material impact on the financial statements. So I think uh, the starting point of uh, professional skepticism is that auditors must understand what it means, how it looks, if, if what is the what is the execution side of professional skepticism and focusing on areas of judgment you know where management can slip in funny things that blow uh, up valuations for example or estimates uh, uh, to make the financials uh, look better uh, i mean it's a it's a combination of risk assessment and then matching that with skill and and personal and behavioral traits as a professional so, Levo, I hope that answered your question. 
uh, auditors must do more to equip themselves to be ready for this because these are the things that happened and resulted in audit failures and it ha that is what happened and 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 caused us to be where we are uh, as a profession mm -hmm. globally thanks Imran. i think uh, the link i wanted to make was just that i think with technology developing certainly we should we're, we're likely to see um more need for that um, the Fokonolo has actually just gone ahead of me. I wanted to just say that while I still have a lot of questions that I could ask, I want to make sure that our audience has an opportunity to ask questions. But I ask that those that do have specific questions for our panelists make use of the Q&A just so that it's easier for us to track them. Um, I'm going to just take, I, I haven't read the Fokonolo, I'm going to read it as it is. But Fokonolo asks, I'm looking at the external auditing structure and evolution of business to the complex technology operative mechanisms that organizations are using, is it possible to close the expectation even if being professionally skeptical to accounting records? Um, I'm going to let any one of you answer that question, but please can I ask that we use the, the Q&A? Maybe let me do this. Somebody can think about answering Lisa Konolo's question, but I just want to go back to Linda one more time. Linda, you know, um, as I was listening to Imre, he mentioned ethics, he mentioned um, an independent mindset. So that is already the work that um, the IWSB and the IESB are doing. I like the term professional courage. Is there really more that the standard setters can do? Um, what is your reaction to that? Yeah, that's a good question. I think we will go a long way if we can get the appropriate level of implementation in the spirit of the standards. I think that would push us very far. Having said that, I do believe there are things that the standard sectors can do and should do and should continue to do. And, and I'll sort of talk about that in principle. Um, firstly, there's a lot more in my view around transparency and Sandra spoke about it. People want to understand and see things through the eyes of the auditor because the auditor sees things when he, he or she does the audit and investors and stakeholders would like to have some insight. We've got ISA 701 that came out very many years ago, but that's only applied for listed companies. And ISA 701 disclose, makes the auditor disclose key audit matters, those issues, those matters that were of most significance to the auditor, that the auditor spent a lot of time on, where there was a lot of judgment, et cetera. And we've seen over the years in the listed company space how that improved the confidence in the financial statements. Because what happens now if the auditor says, um, to use Imre's example, this was a very difficult area to audit because there's a lot of judgment involved. It's in COVID. It's, let's say, in the insurance industry provisions for claims or whatever. As soon as the auditor starts disclosing this difficult area, it in a way forces the company to be more transparent, to give more insight into their judgments, their assumptions, etc. So, We've seen how that has actually built confidence in audit and made companies more transparent. So from the PIOB, we are encouraging, especially the IWSB, to think about that type of transparency when it comes to fraud and going concern. To say, you know, there might be instances where there are very strong fraud indicators in a company, companies in financial distress, there's not sufficient capacity in the finance team, there is debt that's being um, renegotiated, etc. There might not have been um, fraud identified, but there are red flags that this is the type of instance where fraud can occur. And maybe some of that type of disclosure would be useful. So for me, that's an area where standard setters on transparency where standard setters can definitely play a role. It's also an area where regulators can play a role because it would be useful if they make those key audit matter requirements maybe um, apply beyond just the listed companies because they are big public interest entities um, and so on where that would be useful. The other place where I really think standard setters have a role to play is with 
everything that's happening and developing in the world out there. We have chat GPT, we have sustainability reporting, ESG, we have so many things happening out there and people are pushing, investors are pushing, stakeholders, everybody, customers are pushing companies to disclose mm -hmm. more behind financial information. It means nothing if there's not a level of assurance. It means nothing if there are not also ethical requirements for the preparers to avoid greenwashing and so on. So there are really important roles to be played by both of these two standard setting boards when it comes to all of these very many things in a very fast changing world. Thank you, Linda. Sandra, can I put you on the spot to respond to the question on um, the possibility of closing the gap in the context of complex technology? Sorry, Libohono, that's mine. I lost you yes. for a bit there. Yeah. Um, I was asking uh, I was asking you to maybe respond to the question that was well, the first question that was posed on the complex technologies and um the and closing the, the expectation gap. Okay. Um even from uh Embry's uh, comments, I actually wanted to just add on to the issue of the professional uh skepticism. And I believe uh, a big part of our audience uh, is actually auditors. And one of the mm -hmm. things, having come from the auditing background before uh, moving on to uh, being the client in this case, um, one of the challenges that uh, most auditor or audit firms actually experience is that you send in your, your I don't say young, but yeah, probably young in experience, um, uh, to the client uh, to look at the books of accounts. Um, this young auditor uh, needs to have uh, quite a bit of training to understand what motivates the client. I remember in my training in audit, um, the first training that we received was that you need to really understand what is the motivation for your client. And the motivation for clients is actually different. If you go to the NGO sector, it will probably be uh, are they reporting uh, the utilization of funds in a proper way? If you go to a commercial enterprise, they might be looking at profits um, and probably be looking at their bonuses. If you go to the financial sector, they might be looking at the value of the organization. So in terms of your value, of assets, you would have to put a lot of emphasis and focus there. But who does that to really get your auditor to understand and to spend quite a bit of time to understand what is motivating uh, management? I think one of the emerging issues that um, the audit trainers in this room, and, and maybe this goes also to the PIOB, is that uh, there needs to be quite a bit of training on emotional intelligence so that when your auditors land at the client, they're able to understand what really is motivating the management. And based on that assessment, then um, they would have a clear uh, starting point um, in terms of where to exercise some additional skepticism. So in a sense, then I fully agree there's the technical bits uh, but also in Imbri's words, it's more of a behavioral because you need to understand what really drives the management. And now to the question on uh, the external audit structure and the evolution of technology. I think that's the other emerging issue that um, even your CFO, your client, is actually trying to adapt very quickly. And this is to the auditors in the room. Your, your preparer of the financial statement is also trying to quickly understand, quickly adapt, uh, the technology, complex technology, if you think about a uh, robotic process automation, if you think about artificial intelligence, there's a lot of utilization of big data in the organizations. How does the auditor prepare to even be in a position to understand the systems and how they affect the financial statements. And I know most of the audit firms have separated the financial audit from the systems audit. And sometimes um, this may not be the case across, but sometimes there isn't a very good communication between these two teams. So that then at the end of the day, uh, there's a comprehensive audit report that comes from the audit team. So I think uh, just to answer the question on whether the adoption of technology would be in a position to close the gap, maybe not to close the gap, but maybe to reduce the gap 
because if there's a good understanding of the systems that are being used of the emerging issues that are coming up then uh, one is able to even understand the the information that feeds into your ERP, which in any in most cases, then is what is utilized in the de derivation of the financial uh, statements. I think I hope that answers the question. Unless uh, Imri would like to add uh, something to that question. Yes, thanks. Yeah, thank you, Sandra. If I I'd just like to add one uh, thing to that. Um, so um, I, I read a report issued by the World Economic Forum called the Chief Risk Officers Outlook for 2013. Um, it's a very, very interesting report. It's available on the, on, on, on the website, the World Economic Forum website. And all of the chief risk officers that were surveyed, they did a survey agreed with the prop proposition that the development and deployment of, of artificial intelligence, for example, it, it's fast outpacing the management and the potential ethical and social risks associated with, with it. So more than 90% uh, from chief risk officers surveyed across the globe say that regulation of, for example, artificial uh, generative artificial intelligence technologies should be, should be accelerated. So people are calling for regulation, but to, to closer to the question, I think that this is what I want to get to, I read two articles about a couple of weeks ago. For, firstly, KPMG in the US, uh, the CEO uh, Paul Knopp announced a two billion US dollar investment over the five next uh, next five years in partnership with Microsoft to accelerate the use of, and development of generative AI. And it it, it also speaks to auditing. Um, uh, another one that I read, uh, saw, and read was PwC investing one billion dollars in AI uh, in terms of uh, ex um, you know enhancing its audit processes audit quality and and even um, um, you know the, the the entire way they used to do auditing so uh, to, to the question it's a very good question I think um, regulators are, are are playing catch up at this stage in terms of emerging technologies um, and, uh, and and yes, regulation is something that needs to keep track because otherwise we'll create uh, blind spots within the accounting and auditing system that could land us in big trouble as a profession. So uh, yes, we have to work hard to keep to, to keep abreast of the technology, but also to be wary and aware of the risks that that are associated with it. Of course, there's a lot of positives. Um, there's a lot of uh, um, you know positive things that can come out of it, efficiencies, et cetera, 100 percent coverage of populations, all of that. But we need to be we need to remain uh, as professionals also, um, I would say skeptical that we don't miss something because of technology. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, unfortunately, time has really, really flown by, and I don't want us to overrun in the interest of you know respecting everybody's time. So, um, <clears throat> Linda, there was a question that I saw, but I can't find it now that asked about whether we need standards uh, for the use of AI and technology in audits. But also, as you answer that, I'd like to ask all of my um, esteemed panelists to also just help me close the session with your parting shot thoughts as it relates to um, what do the, you think the expectation gap, um, how it's going to evolve over the next decade and um, what the role of the different stakeholders, be technology, regulation, or just continuous engagement can play in narrowing or closing the gap. But before that, do you need me stand it, Linda? Thank you. I was just reading that question. Thank you, Lebo Hong. Um, I think it was actually posed at Imre, so you, Imre, you owe me yeah, one. Just, um, yeah. the, the question is, is it necessary for, you know, considering where, where technology is going, um, is it necessary to have standards around that? And both the, the two standard-setting boards has got the impact of technology on the um, strategies and work plans. Um, it's a little bit difficult to sort of decide what it is that they have to do. There's a lot of research, there's a lot of understanding that needs to be done because the one element of it is the ethics around audit is also selling some of these products to the audit clients and how does that impact the independence? That's probably the easier thing to solve. And then the use of technology 
as part of the audit, the risk of, you know, some of these um, technologies to potentially replace some of the people in the audit team the, uh, or using that, but how do you verify it? So both of these topics are on, uh, or the, these topics are on both of the agendas of the two standard setting boards. There are organizations and some of the large um, professional institutes are doing significant research with academics on understanding some of these topics. And, and I think we need to latch on to that. We often don't have the capacity as smaller organizations to fund it, to oversee it, but there is a lot happening in the space when it comes to understanding all of those various um, aspects and elements of it, because it's not the matter of write, writing a standard for the sake of the standard. The second element to that question was, you know, and it was sort of linked to what you asked in concluding remarks, Le Bouchang, is how will all of these things affect the expectation gap? If I believe if we don't, I, I believe that for lots of things, if we don't push things forward, they will not stay where they are it will go backwards because the pace of change will push us backwards. So we all as stakeholders, whether it's on the standard setting side, the regulatory side, the preparer side, we all need to push forward else the expectation gap will widen because there will be more expected of audit. You know, that we, we spoke about technology and ESG and all of those things. There will be more and more expectations and not just the standard setters, the regulators, the, the profession themselves, the preparers all need to work together to be more transparent, to be more ethical, to think more clearly around the ethics and the, uh, keep themselves and ourselves up to date. The world is moving fast. And if we, if we stand still, we're going to be very, very far behind very quickly. So I hope that's useful. Thank you. Thank you. Can I ask Sandra? Thank you. Sandra, so, thank you. you. Yes. So just uh, as I conclude on my on from the CFO's uh, site or from the prepared site, um, and this is also just to to add to what Linda has just said. Um, a study by Ancentia uh, said that only about a third of financial tasks have been automated. The interesting thing is that most CFOs believe that 80% of their tasks can actually be automated. So in a sense, your client as the auditor is moving towards um, technology-based uh, work. The other thing that I would just want to indicate is that um, most CFOs, same report actually uh, indicated that 76% of CFOs believe that uh, unifying different data sets is vital to achieving business objectives. Now think about it from the bit of the, the changing roles of the CFO uh, from traditional bookkeeping and uh, ensuring uh, correct accounting, not correct accounting, fair accounting, fair estimation of uh, everything to being a catalyst and uh, strategies for the organization in supporting growth. So with, with this in mind, it would mean that the auditor has to be prepared prepared for this change. In leaders' words, the world is changing. So the auditor also has to keep abreast of what is happening. So in terms of the expectations, I believe that um, the auditor has to really um, put a lot of effort to just catch up. Otherwise, the expectation gap is going to widen. In terms of issues to do with ethics, in terms of how they conduct themselves, we cannot have audit firms being charged uh, 100 million for cheating in its hands, which they're supposed to be promoting, uh, they're supposed to be promoting ethics. So in terms of um, uh, equipping uh, the staff, if you think about the clients, uh, most financial experts will tell you that today, if they are looking for accountants, one of the skills that they are really looking for is the ability to dissect data. So data science becomes very critical. Um, one of the other skills that is very critical is the ability to be able to use technology and to be in a position to uh, uh, operate with technology uh, to a large extent. So it means that our auditors have to be quickly equipped to be able to adapt to this changing trend within that space to, 
better perform their work and also to reduce the expectation gap. Of course, that said, uh, the traditional role of auditor still remains, compliance and uh, assuring that uh, financial statements are fairly uh, prepared and there is no material uh, misstatements in the financial statements, but the expectations are going to continue increasing. And like I said at the beginning, this is just the way the world is. Uh, all stakeholders across different uh, spheres are actually uh, putting in more expectations. So the same remains for auditors. And so I believe the different stakeholders need to work together from the education um, perspective, the training of accountants and auditors, to the regulators, to the preparers, to the shareholders. I think all stakeholders have to work together to be in a position to reduce this uh, expectation gap. Yeah, and that would be my closing remark for this session. Thank you. Thank you, Sandra. Thank you, Lebo Khan and Noe on, on, the, on, the, on the hour. Uh, I, I fully agree with Linda and Sandra on, on everything they said. Uh, just to add on maybe a, my perspective on a few more things. I think there will always be an expectation gap. Um, as long as there are failures coming through uh, where people lose money, uh, I think that's unavoidable. Um, our focus as a regulator in South Africa and as regulators globally is primarily on driving audit quality with the firms and other and you know uh, employing other related activities to help limit limit these failures. Um, uh, but looking at the the number of countries here today, it, it's very important that uh, our efforts are backed by legislation in in, in our different jurisdictions. Uh, you know, to be an effective regulator, have the legal background and backing. Um, to, to enable you know, robust monitoring and enforcement uh, uh, to promote the expected behavior. And also as regulators, we have to invest in technology ourselves and our own understanding of technology. Um, I, I did mention the firms are investing millions and even billions of dollars in technology that I believe if used and applied appropriately could enhance audit quality and help close the, close the gap. But if it's not gonna be done correctly, or with caution and, and taking ethics into consideration as well, uh, it might widen the gap. So it's a, it's a fine line that as regulators, we're a little bit nervous around the technology um, uh, being used by firms. We want to understand how they will do it and what sort of controls they will have in place. So that's quite high on the agenda uh, at EFR uh, at the moment. It's not all doom and gloom on closing. Uh, most auditors still do a very good job. Most investors that I'm talking to still rely very heavily on audits to perform their investment, to perform their risk assessments and, and, and decide on their investments. And it is important that we, yes, we must look at the auditors, but it, we must also look at all the role players in the financial reporting ecosystem, uh, not only the auditors. Um, there are several role players um, uh, that, that, that could that then could and should be held equally accountable because they are often the primary cause of some of these corporate failures. So yes, I agree with Sandra and, 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 and Linda, we have to work together. All different functions within the system needs to work effectively together. And it starts with each and, one of, each and every one of us to hold ourselves accountable uh, so that we can do a proper job and, and, do, and do justice to this uh, sort of uh, career and, and this profession that we chose uh, to be a part of. And uh, I'm still very positive and uh, it was great. Thank you very much for the opportunity and to Pafa and everybody on the call today. Uh, I hope it added some value from my, from my side and uh, maybe our paths will cross uh, in the near future. Thank you very much, Lebo. Thank you to all our panelists. Um, uh, Caroline, I know we're late, but I have to just uh, you know echo Linda's call and uh, tell everybody, who, if you don't know, on the 24th of August, there is a consultation that is closing on um, ISA 570 going concern. So please, please, please respond. We want to hear Africa's voice. 30th of September is the closing date for the PIOB's call for nominations for the Stakeholder Advisory Council. So that is how you get your voice heard and how you contribute to closing the gap. I'm going to stop there. Thank you, Carolyn. Over to you. Thank you, everyone, for a fabulous event. I really appreciate um, it's one of our longer events. It's 90 minutes. So thank you very much for everyone staying on board. And thank you for the wealth of information and the very rigorous debate and discussion. 
Thank you very much. And please participate to everybody. Thank you. Bye, everyone.